giving um, a uh, short uh, presentation. So this is basically uh, the program. Uh, I will start uh, in a short while with uh, introducing uh, you uh, to the rationale in the background why we have uh, set up this uh, monitor project. And uh, I would like to also point out some practical issues here. It would be nice to turn off your camera and your microphone uh, to, uh, to make it as smooth as possible. I know it's always a challenge to organize uh, uh, an, uh, an event uh, uh, completely online, uh, but I hope you can understand we uh, try to do our best to make it as uh, as uh, as smooth as possible. So um, I would also indicate that we, as you can already notice, uh, we will record this uh, this webinar. Uh, that is what we promised to the uh, uh, EU. Uh, but we will make sure that we uh, that we comply with all uh, privacy uh, uh, regulations. Uh, that we will, for example, delete any. Um, any uh, sections uh, uh, about the Q&A so that we will uh, be able to uh, to to guarantee uh, full uh, privacy. I would also encourage you for the moment at least during the uh, presentations uh, not to use your chat function uh, as it might distract uh, the uh, the presenters but uh, don't worry you will have plenty of opportunity to also um, interact uh, with uh, with the presenters and with uh, members of uh, of uh, of this partnership. Um, after my presentation, I will give the floor to uh, Fred Coulter uh, to uh, present the uh, uh, monitoring evaluation manual that we have produced uh, throughout this uh, project. And uh, Fred uh, has worked and and uh, researched. Uh, for over uh, 30 years um, in uh, with practitioners in a sport related context. His focus has been on working with and for uh, client organizations. His interests uh, relate to various aspects of both uh, sport development and sport for development organizations. And uh, he has done extensive work in the, not only in the UK, but also in Africa, India and Latin America. And uh, since uh, a number of years, Fred has also uh, been affiliated to our research group Sport and Society as a visiting professor. Uh, after, uh, after Fred's uh, presentation, uh, I would then uh, like to give the floor to uh, John Taylor, who will talk about uh, how to deal with all these uh, data that is collected through m and &E, uh, monitoring evaluation that is, and how it can be processed uh, and how it can be entered into uh, um, what uh, he will explain uh, specific Excel uh, spreadsheets that have been produced and how they can be analyzed. And John is a lecturer at uh, the uh, University of uh, Stirling in Scotland, and he has experience for more than 20 years in uh, res as a researcher and a research manager in relation to monitoring and evaluation of a range of sports initiatives with a special interest in the evaluation of sport, uh, for, develop, sport for development uh, programs. Uh, um, so he, uh, he will then uh, be uh, uh, sharing this information uh, just in a while. Uh, next, uh, we will ask one of our partners um, uh, from the Sport for Employability organizations that, we, uh, that, that were in a partnership to give some reflections on the manual uh, and this will be done by uh, Saad Mohammed, and Saad is uh, the head of uh, research and impact at Sport for Life UK. And uh, Saad has expertise in monitoring evaluation, uh, strategic planning, and also in uh, project performance analysis. Um, and then uh, next, uh, we, uh, but I must uh, already indicate that we will have opportunities to have Q and A, of course. Uh, after each of the presentations that uh, you will be uh, you will be uh, invited to ask questions but we will foresee also if you like to wait until the end that's fine because we then foresee a specific uh, Q&A session where we then of course uh, would like to ask you to raise your hand if you want to take uh, to uh, take the stand and um, and then of course they uh, put on your microphone and it was also also nice to uh, show your uh, uh, to the audience, so then uh, turn on the camera as well. That would be uh, much appreciated. Um, 
we then would of course uh, invite you to also make use of the chat function uh, to uh, to make it as interactive as uh, possible. Um, and then I would uh, come back to you uh, by giving uh, some closing comments uh, on um, on the whole project and uh, and also some uh, some future uh, activities that we will uh, set up um, within uh, the the context of this uh, project. Now I would like to start by uh, acknowledging and and uh, expressing our gratitude. Uh, to the, towards the Erasmus Plus uh, program of the EU that allowed us the opportunity to uh, to uh, to do this uh, project, which is an Erasmus Plus collaborative partnership, and starting started in the, uh, the beginning of 2019, and officially will end officially uh, at the end of uh, next month. We'd also uh, uh, introduce the collaborative partnership that we have set up uh, with. Uh, with eight partners in total, uh, with us as the project coordinator, so the VUB, uh, the Sport and uh, the Sport and Society Research Group, uh, we um, we were very happy that we could uh, be joined by six uh, sport for employability organizations. So I will talk to them. I will introduce them uh, separately uh, in a minute. Um, and also we had a partner uh, uh, Enzo Youth, uh, which is uh, the non-profit uh, youth. Uh, organization of uh, ENGZO. ENGZO stands for the European Non-Governmental uh, Sport Organization. Um, and we we also uh, were pleased to have the support of the ILO, which is the International Labour Organization, which we regard here as a global network and employment uh, policy organization. But as I mentioned, I would also want to introduce our Sport for Employability organizations, which uh, were partner in this uh, project. Um, and that is uh, Street League from the United Kingdom, uh, Altenom Sport Association from uh, Hungary, uh, Rotterdam Sport Support from the Netherlands, uh, Sport for Life from the United Kingdom, um, Rheinflanke from Germany, and uh, Magic Bus from India. And uh, that uh, the last uh, last partner is a non-EU partner, and we have uh, encouraged uh, to uh, to get them on board as well because uh, they really can provide an added value. Uh, this is what you need to prove, of course, if you want to have a non-EU partner involved in your partnership. And we think uh, Magic Bus was really well suited for that purpose, as it is the largest uh, sport for development organization in, uh, in India and uh, one of the largest in the world. It has more than 600 employees uh, and volunteers, and it's been uh, operational for more than uh, 20 years, working with uh, some of the world's uh, uh, poorest uh, children uh, living in slum areas uh, and young people as well, and, and try to equip them with uh, skills uh, that will uh, help uh, that will help them to grow up and move out of uh, poverty. Organization uh, uh, has uh, reach uh, reaches uh, uh, annually more than 400,000 children and uh, 35,000 uh, uh, young people. Uh, from different parts in, in India. So we were happy to have uh, these partners on board uh, in, uh, within our partnership. Now the rationale and, and why we set up this uh, project uh, goes back to the, uh, the alarming uh, high uh, rate uh, of uh, uh, youth and employment uh, within the EU. Uh, if you see at the latest and most recent numbers, one in six of the uh, 20 to 34 year olds uh, uh, in the EU uh, were considered as need uh, youth, which is, as you all know, uh, young people that uh, are neither in uh, employment nor in education or in training. So that stands for about 13 million young people uh, today uh, living in this, uh, in this situation. Uh, and these people in this type of uh, uh, status, they uh, will become, there's a high risk that they will become socially as well as economically marginalized. Uh, so uh, it is uh, another surprise that the EU regard this as an urgent uh, task to uh, reduce this high level of youth and employment uh, among uh, these young people. And uh, for that, they do a lot of uh, uh, initiatives, uh, still are, uh, and that has had, had some impact as well as other initiatives uh, regionally and, and, and locally. Uh, and we have seen a decrease uh, over the past couple of years in the number uh, of uh, young needs, but still the numbers are very high. 
as you can see uh, uh, what I mentioned just now. Uh, and there's uh, there's the prospection that, uh, or you might say the expectation uh, that there will be a negative impact uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic on this situation, making these youth in most vulnerable situation uh, also dealing with uh, with more negative uh, experience from uh, from the pandemic we are all experienced right now. We also make a link with sport, uh, and we do that because uh, we have seen over and over again that it's also been uh, indicated by the EU. For example, in the EU work plan for sport, the, the most recent one, the, the, the present one, we see that they recognize that sport can contribute to achieve the overall uh, political priorities uh, of the EU, among others, uh, inclusion and also uh, in, uh, in employment. And again, if we look at the uh, current uh, key action two uh, within Erasmus Plus uh, specific priority for sport, for example, the promoting education in and through sport, we see specific uh, uh, emphasis again on uh, looking for more ways to promote employability through sport. I also want to point out that we uh, we did a study uh, in 2016. Uh, where we uh, also, with the support of the European Commission, uh, where we uh, did a mapping of uh, sport for employability organizations in the EU. Uh, and uh, that le led us to uh, do an, do an in-depth in study basically on, uh, on 10 uh, sport for employability organizations targeting young needs uh, uh, located in, in eight uh, different uh, member states of the EU. Um, we uh, we then came up with a uh, generic uh, program theory, trying to understand better what makes uh, a good program, what uh, can be an uh, an effective program, uh, taking uh, the different uh, uh, things into consideration. Another element of this uh, study is that uh, we have seen uh, a need uh, for more understanding of uh, how to make use of uh, M and E and to define more precisely what type of impact organizations are aimed for. That really came out as an, as an, um, an outcome of, uh, of uh, result of this study, which, uh, by the way, is, uh, is similar to a recommendation that was made by the EU expert group on human resource development in sport made a similar uh, recommendation for the need for a monitoring evaluation. So the objective of the uh, project, the monitor project, was to develop a monitoring evaluation a manual that can help sport-based organizations uh, to increase the level of employability of young needs uh, that they are working with. And uh, just uh, like to uh, end by giving a, a short overview of the project phases that we have uh, that we have done. Uh, we have started with an online kickoff in the beginning of the project. We then uh, have uh, conducted a literature review on relevant sources. We did uh, several uh, interactive uh, workshops uh, and study visits uh, to the uh, different uh, partner sport for employability organizations. Uh, here are some pictures of uh, these uh, fine and uh, very inspiring uh, 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 gatherings we had with all these uh, partners, uh, which were very inspiring and helped us a lot in the coming up with uh, the, the second uh, the phase uh, that was then a draw up a, a draft version of the manual and then we returned to the partners and we had again uh, feedback uh, from them uh, in order us to help them to uh, and help us to then uh, construct and develop an updated version of the manual at that point uh, we uh, we were able uh, thanks to the help of uh, john taylor uh, to uh, set up a specific excel spreadsheets uh, and produce a, a video helping to understand better how to uh, do the data processing and uh, data analysis. And we uh, specifically decided to use Excel as a software, which is which is available for everybody instead of going for specific uh, um, specific software that might be uh, difficult to access for uh, for all or, or big uh, uh, might be difficult more difficult to access for more organizations. Uh, and then, uh, as we all know, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, appeared, which uh, had an impact not only on the work of uh, the uh, organizations, uh, which they are still struggling with at the moment. As you all know, uh, 
which is the case for many other uh, uh, situations. Uh, it also had an effect on our timing, uh, which uh, that has, has caused the delay in uh, in the different time in the different uh, phases we were planning uh, to do. Um, uh, fortunately, the agency provided us the opportunity to uh, to extend uh, our project because it would have been would have finished at the end of last year, so 2020. But it allowed us to have an extension for six months. So at the end of next month, uh, we still we can con continue until that time to uh, finalize. And that was good uh, because it also allowed us, although in difficult situation, in difficult circumstances, to also uh, work. <laughs> so we had to go to the online uh, era where we had the communications uh, like uh, we have today. Um, we also uh, were able to uh, still uh, do some pilot testing uh, in uh, two uh, uh, sport for employability partner organizations in difficult uh, in difficult circumstances. So we thank them for that, and that they still were managed uh, managed to uh, to pilot test some of the scales that are in the manual and will be uh, mentioned uh, later on. Um, and then we uh, that all resulted into a final version of the uh, manual. Uh, which uh, in the final phase of the project we are in now uh, then uh, leads up to a dissemination and uh, trying to uh, get as many people uh, uh, acquainted and, on, and informed about uh, what we came up with. Uh, so the webinar is one thing, of course, like today, what we will share with you. Uh, there will be also a final uh, conference, uh, which will be online and will be on June 17th. And uh, uh, I will explain a little bit more about uh, the, uh, the the basic idea of that conference uh, at the end, uh, at the closing remarks I will make at the very end of this uh, webinar. With that, we also have a website, uh, as you probably already know, because you registered uh, probably through the website for this webinar, uh, which uh, provides a lot of information and uh, will also uh, provide in the coming uh, period and even after today, also uh, bring you uh, uh, most uh, information that we uh, that we uh, that we can share with you. So uh, have a look at the website in the coming days. And that would be very helpful. Um, and also we make use active use of social media uh, to uh, to make the dissemination uh, uh, as uh, as optimal as possible. Uh, what the webinar is concerned, the objective, as I already mentioned, it's to introduce the monitor and evaluation manual to you uh, and uh, to, to, to the audience, uh, which we expect to come from uh, either support for employability organizations or support for development organizations or any uh, interested uh, other uh, organization. Um, and before uh, I will uh, upload the, uh, the uh, presentation for, uh, for the next speaker, which is Fred, I would like to thank uh, also the, the members of our uh, um, coordinating team. Besides uh, uh, myself, of course, uh, Fred and John, who will meet in a minute, uh, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the support and the, 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 the valuable work that our colleagues have done as well, being uh, Inge de Rom, uh, Tessa Commerce, and uh, Karin van den Hoeken. Good day, everybody. Um... I'm asking you to please bear with me. Uh, I'm sitting in my office looking at a screen, uh, trying to talk to over 70 people. Uh, this is the first time I've done this type of presentation, and I find this makes communication rather difficult because one's normally used to seeing an audience and seeing the reaction. So please bear with me. The structure of my presentation will be, I'm going to first of all, very briefly outline the overall purpose and the orientation of the manual, what we think it's about, then I'm going to outline three basic principles underpinning the manual. And then I am going to outline the structure and content of the manual. Although this is inevitably going to be quite descriptive, I'm also going to highlight selected theoretical issues as I go through. OK. Now, the overall purpose of the manual was to provide a framework to support organizations to develop a theory of change for their programs to understand and explain how and why the program, a program will achieve its desired outcomes. It's also to assist organizations to better understand the nature and measurement of the desired relevant outcomes associated with the rather vague and ill-defined notion of employability. 
So, and it's also to provide guidance for establishing and implementing a framework for the monitoring and evaluation and assistance in analyzing the data. As Mark has said, we provide Excel spreadsheets to allow you to analyze the data. Who is the manual for? Well, first of all, it's for existing programs to enable them to critically evaluate and to critically evaluate the, the program and undertake informed monitoring and evaluation. And during the pilot phase, this was illustrated by Saad Mohammed of Sport for uh, Life, who was speaking later on. He said that the manual, he said the, the manual illustrated we don't know what we don't know. And he said the use of the manual broadened our horizons. So we think for existing programs that allows them to think critically about what they do and adopt a more informed first, uh, approach to defining outcomes and measuring outcomes. But we also think that the manual provides a framework for those seeking to develop sport for employability programs. And you'll see as I work through it, how that, how that will um, work. We also think that the manual would be useful for induction of new staff to programs because it, develop, it, it develops a theory of change approach. It develops a, a deeper understanding of the program and could be used for induction purposes. The first principle is that monitoring and evaluation should be based on a theory of change. We want to move beyond the standard logic model and outcome measurement approach. Most reviews of research in sport for development point to the absence of theories of change. We get logic models which illustrate inputs, outputs, and measure outcomes and sometimes measure impacts. But what we have in the, the standard logic model is unexplained causal arrows. Why do those outputs lead to those outcomes? And why do those outcomes lead to those impacts? So what we say that we need a theory of change to explain how and why a desired change is expected to happen in a particular context. Uh, we say that a theory of change systematically identifies the assumptions underpinning a program. Why do you provide particular activities and what, what are their supposed, what, what are the associated outcomes with those activities and why are those outcomes associated with those activities? And the theory of change maps out the program activities and outputs, their nature and how and why they lead to desired uh, intermediate and final outcomes. How, how do they lead to something which you have defined as employability? So a theory of change allows us to ask these very fundamental questions. Now, we know that in many uh, small organizations, there is a reluctance to undertake m and &E because they think it's just about accountability. But we argue that mon monitoring and evaluation is developmental. It's not just about accountability. And you've already noted Sad's comments about not knowing not knowing what he needs to know. So we think that a theory of change approach leads to capacity building in organizations. A theory of the development of a theory of change is a collective exercise. So as the team develops this theory of change, it leads to greater ownership, common understanding, and greater team integration. It enables organizations personnel to reflect on and analyze their attitudes, beliefs, and practices. And again, another quote from Saad. Saad said that the manual allowed them to ask better questions of ourselves. And we think that that's what the theory of change approach does. A theory of change uh, approach leads to a broad agreement uh, about understanding of assumptions about the relationship between activities and outcomes. The understanding of the relationship between activities and presumed outcomes, we argue leads to a greater integrated and, co and coherent organizational culture and associated program, a more integrated and coherent program. It also enables and improves external communication. Carol Weiss says that policymakers love stories and a theory of change is a story and it allows you to communicate how and why your program is effective. It also concentrates evaluation on critical factors. It identifies the critical factors of success in a program. So that's why we have uh, developed the program around a theory of change approach. The second principle is general applicability. The manual is about employability, but we believe that there's a generic relevance to all sport for development programs. And the reason we say that is the OECD's comment that most employability skills are general in nature. They're relevant for all kinds of occupations and considered necessary to provide a foundation 
for effective and successful participation in the social and economic life of advanced economies. In other words, uh, the employability skills are about personal development, and we believe that the manual therefore has more, a more general applicability to uh, sport for development programs in general. The third principle is sport plus. We don't believe sport on its own will make a limited contribution to developing employability. Sport needs to be amended and or supported with other activities and workshops. That's a fundamental premise of the manual. So we introduced two approaches. One we call Sport Plus One. Sport Plus One is used to develop and the sport is used to develop and consolidate social and mentoring relationships. It facilitates experiential learning of a range of soft skills, teamwork, perceived self-efficacy, communication, conflict management. And we have workshops, parallel workshops dealing with employability issues. But in Sport Plus One, there is no systematic attempt to integrate support and reinforce the issues addressed in the workshops via the sporting practices. We have sport to develop uh, soft skills and we have workshops to develop certain em other employability issues, but there is no uh, systematic integration. So we, in the manual, we propose a, a, an approach called Sport Plus Two. And we, this is based upon uh, research and theory, which says the best way to foster skill acquisition is to integrate sport and life skills and instruction seamlessly rather than attempt to teach these topics separately. And in Sport Plus One, they're taught separately. In Sport, sport Plus Two, which we propose, fully integrates experiential learning through sport into the program by using the sporting activity to illustrate and reinforce the issues dealt with in the parallel life skill workshops. There's a systematic emphasis on the relevance of all program activities to the development of employability, with sports sessions designed to clearly reflect and reinforce workshop content. There is an overlap of the curriculum in the sports program and in the workshops. And the other thing is we think that this approach to experiential learning may be more suited to those who have failed in the school system and feel less confident in formal didactic workshops. So a fully integrated experiential learning program is the thing that underpins the manual. OK, I'm now going to turn to uh, the structure and content of the manual. And as I say, some of this may be uh, slightly descriptive, but I will try to raise theoretical issues as I go through. In section one, we set out the purpose of the manual. And, and this is an area which often loosely used and ill-defined concepts are used. So we provide a general introduction the terms, which are often very loosely used, outcomes, impacts, monitoring, evaluation, summative evaluation, and formative evaluation. So we set out at the very start of the manual how we're going to use terms throughout the manual, and we believe this general clarification is needed in, the, in this area. Section two, we define employability and the nature of outcomes. This explores issues relating to the uh, the definition of ambiguous, the ambiguous term employability. It outlines research based on employer defined components of employability. And for example, that's one of the frameworks we use, uh, which which um, sets out the personal, interpersonal self management, initiative, and delivery components of employability. And we believe by doing this, that's only one example. There's a number of examples in the manual. It allows focused discussion of outcomes, processes and content. I think you have to start with how you define employability and work backwards. What is employability and how will our processes and content address those issues? And section three, uh, this is really for, I think, more for people who are trying to come into the field and don't really understand sport. And what we do is we say there's a, a number of ways of using sport. The first one is sport for personal development, amended games, um, sport to life and football three from street football world are, are outlined in the manual. And then we uh, outline plus sport, sport plus one, sport plus two. I've already explained sport plus one and sport plus two. By plus sport, we mean that sport is just simply used to attract people to a, an employability or a youth work program, and sport is really just a, 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 to, to a, an attractor. It's not used for teaching purposes. And the, the sport attracts people, and then the employability work begins. And we also outlined the importance of social climate uh, in programs 
building relationships based upon respect and trust. And we also use, uh, this plays a, a major role in our manual, which is Ray Pawson's mentoring program theory. And uh, we outline this in detail. The first stage of this is befriending, which is effective, emotional, in which football is used to, uh, or sport is used to develop um, bonds of uh, respect and trust in the program. The mentee recognizes the legitimacy of other people's perspectives. Then we come to direction setting, which is cognitive. This is uh, mentors uh, promoting self-reflection via discussion of alternatives to young people. What have they thought about? What are their ambitions? There are, young people are encouraged to reconsider their values, loyalties, and ambitions. We then come to coaching. Coaching in this case is used slightly differently from the sporting term. This is uh, the, men the mentor coaxes the mentee to acquire the skills and assets and credentials needed to enter the mainstream market. In some of the programs, this can be, this can be uh, achieved via individual learning plans, which enables the participants to better understand how and why these goals can be achieved. So this is addressing the assets and skills that they need. And then we have sponsoring, which is pos positional, which is, use uh, which is using the context of the organization and its members to uh, contact, the, uh, contact the young people with the job market. Many young people have difficulty accessing the job market. So the mentors sponsor and network on behalf of the, the participants into the job market. And we have added one to Parsons program theory, which is ongoing support. One of the people in the, uh, in the project said to us, this is when they get a job, that's when the real learning starts. So ongoing support is essential, but ongoing support in employment is also a way of, it's attractive to employers, because employers then think that they're not going to be left alone with a possibly problematic employee. So the program continues, in some cases, up to 12 months ongoing support. So the mentoring, uh, Boston's program theory uh, uh, for mentoring plays a large part in our manual and in our program theory, which I'll talk about in a minute. At the end of this, we ask, how do you choose the programs? Well, the, the, you choose the programs based on your priorities and your desired outcomes and the nature of the participants themselves and what they need. It depends on your resources, the mentoring. Uh, to do the mentoring, you require people who are capable of doing the mentoring. It depends on the nature of the program you choose in Sport Plus One and Sport Plus Two. And it depends on the expertise you have in the organization. So what this section does, it outlines the range of possibilities. And then uh, it's up to you to choose which of these you adopt, depending on those three criteria. Section four deals with logic models and theories of change. Uh, the logic model is a useful management <coughs> accountability tool. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's it's used it's useful for summative evaluation, saying what you've achieved. However, there are limitations. What we do is we outline the limitation of a logic model. There's unexplained and assumed causal relationships. The logic model has unexplained arrows, which the theories of change the theory of change tries to address. What is the relationship between output and outcome? And what is the relationship between outcome? outcome and impact. Logic models tend to assume those relationships and not explain them. Uh, and a logic model starts with the means, what you do, not with ends. So it tells you what you do, but it doesn't tell you why you do it. So it doesn't deal with the quality of components or the mechanisms and experiences that lead to change. What is it about those red arrows that makes the program effective? And that's what we deal with in this section. So that's why we introduced a theory of change approach. This is beyond description, which is a logic model, and it seeks to develop explanation. It starts with the desired outcomes. What is employability? And how and why do our programs address those issues? How will they lead to those desired outcomes? So it forces you to under outline your assumptions and question your assumptions. And it also <clears throat> asks you to address the mechanism of change. What is it about your activities that will lead young people to develop, to change their attitudes, to develop skills? How will they do that? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Section five is an outline of how to develop a theory of change for sport and employability. This is a collective process of developing a theory of change is developmental, so each organization develops its own. Uh, so what the, the section does, it outlines the process of developing an illustrative detailed theory of change. Mark talked about the earlier project we did for the European Union. We developed a theory of change in that, and that is used here. I'm not going to work, th work through it because it's too, it's, it, it'll take too long. I don't have enough time. Um, and, but we have published an academic article in the International Journal of Sport Policy and Politics where the, the academic and theoretical aspects of this are dealt with in more detail than they are in the manual. The manual offers a more practical illustration of a, 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 an illustrative de detailed theory of change. And also in the section, we provide two types of graphical presentation for theory of change to allow you to communicate with potential clients, potential sponsors and funders. And section six is pretty standard stuff. It's we outline methods of data collection, the strengths and weaknesses of a range of methods of data collection. We look at self-completion surveys. There are issues here of uh, literacy. Um, interviewer administered. There are issues here of uh, bias of answering questions from people who run the programs themselves. Small group discussions. Observation. We we provide some observation schedules, uh, which I'll talk about, and of course mentoring. You collect the mentoring process can be used to collect data, and in order to try to reduce the workload of people in overstretched organisations, we emphasise integrated data collection and outcome development. Uh, a number of the uh, uh, methods that we propose will allow you to both mentor and uh, collect integrated uh, collect data at the same time. And we also raise the issue of social desirability bias and respondents responses. We think this is an issue because if you uh, use this and you deliver the program and you have an intimate relationship with some people, they may give you the answers they think you want to get. So that's an issue that has to be, um, this is an issue that has to be addressed when you collect your data. Section seven uh, is, uh, I think, one of the most important sections in the um, manual. What it does, it lists uh, nine separate scales, measurement scales, perceived self-efficacy, locus of control, work locus of control, the outcome star and goal setting, uh, self-esteem, resilience, teamwork, decision-making and social skills. These are all multi-dimensional and often, uh, these are terms which are often used very, very loosely. So we think that uh, what this uh, section does is help you to define the multidimensional nature of some of these con concepts. We use validated scales, non-validated scales, and, and we provide some observation sh schedules. All these are used with permission, and the permissions are noted in the manual. As part of the section of this section, we define the meaning and relevance of each one of these uh, measurements to employability. But we, what we also do is we outline the program processes, develop and improve them. And the argument would be that if your program doesn't contain these processes, you shouldn't use this measurement because your program isn't designed to develop those measurements. So what we do in this section is we outline program processes, which theoretically and research uh, proves are related to these outcomes. And we also provide uh, how to, uh, a section on how to interpret the results when you get the results. So it's a very comprehensive approach to each one of these nine measurements. The choice of scales is up to you. <clears throat> it depends on your definition of employability. It depends on your theory of change. It depends on the program processes. Are the program processes related, for example, to develop a locus of control or the resilience? Um, and it depends on your approach to monitoring and evaluation, how you would use the validated and non-validated scales. And also in uh, each one of the scales is included in a separate appendix, so they can be copied and used directly. We provide usable copies of each one of the scales in appendix one. 
now about the this section is non-prescriptive. It really depends on you and your processes, which one of these you would choose. However, we do place an emphasis on perceived self-efficacy. And we do that for, uh, re for a reason. Bandura says that people's beliefs about their capabilities to produce designated levels of performance that exercise influence over events that affect their lives. Self-efficacy beliefs determines how people feel, think, motivate themselves and behave. Self perceived self-efficacy is fundamental to processes of learning and development. And Pajari says, self-efficacy beliefs touch virtually every aspect of people's lives, whether they think productively, self-debilitatingly, pessimistically or optimistically, how well they motivate themselves and persevere in the face of adversities, their vulnerability to stress and depression and the life choices they make. So we believe that perceived self-efficacy as an early outcome and a mechanism. It has to be established very early in the program so people believe that they can learn. Bandura says that people only learn when they can, when they believe they can learn. So programs have to uh, establish perceived self-efficacy very early on. It's an interim outcome, not a final outcome, because it acts as a mechanism for the rest of the program. <clears throat> in the uh, work with the our partners, we discovered three broad uses for the outcome scales. The first one is diagnostic. Many programs start with a deficit view of participants and seek to compensate for presumed deficiencies without actually measuring those whether or not those deficiencies exist. So what our skills do, they allow you to obtain a more robust and objective identification of the strengths and weaknesses of participants and possibly adapt your programs accordingly. They're also <clears throat> useful for measuring change and development, using at least two occasions to assess the extent of change and development uh, which participants experience during the program. And John Taylor will talk about that later on. The third one is <clears throat> we, we find that the outcome skills were a useful basis for mentoring discussions. Many aspects of employability are relatively vague and ill-defined. So the skills can assist mentors to structure discussions with participants, ensure that all aspects of the concepts and issues are covered. For example, asking someone, do they have high self-esteem is not equivalent to actually going through the scale with them and, and trying to understand the various complexities of self-esteem. Section eight, again, is relatively standard stuff. It's social profile data and questionnaire design. It's about cross tabulation and understanding data. We outline a range of social profile data, which I won't go through here. I'll just mention ethnicity and disability. We have to leave that to each individual organization because ethnicity is in some cultures, regardless, a bit too sensitive to um, um, ask. And the data should be collected on the basis of the, the official definitions in each country. And the nature of disability is too varied to include in, in our standardized questionnaire. It might be regardless too sen sensitive. And of course, it might also, it might already be known to the organizations as part of the recruitment process. But people's disability has to be taken into account when program is designed because we have to design for vulnerability. And then we outline questionnaire design, self-completion and interview administered. And of course, self-completion may not be possible in certain contexts and an interview administered may be um, required. Section nine is data handling and the Excel spreadsheets. As Mark said, what we have done is we provided Excel spreadsheets related to each one of the nine scales, or eight, eight scales, sorry. And the outcome star is not included in this. It provides information on instructions on the following, the general data protection regulations of the EU, how to process survey data using the excess scales, a uh, file, sorry, reporting the survey findings and processing data for other scales. It also includes a video done by the great John Taylor, who will follow me and explain this in more detail. It provides a video outlining the process of data entry and provides the Excel skills. We have done this, of course, because we know that the resources of many small organizations are such that often com computing is beyond their resources and their expertise. So we have sought to make a contribution to that. 
Section 10 is reporting. In our, this, we know that many of your uh, funders will require uh, reporting in template format, but just in case we included this, um, we thought the section would assist thinking about communicating results and performance of programs. Um, the initial draft that we gave was deemed by our partners to be too academic, which seems to me to be the longest four letter word in the English language. So what we what we have done is we have based the reporting data on the requirements of Comic Relief. And here I'd like to thank Ollie Dawson of Comic Relief for allowing us to do that. Comic Relief is a major UK funder. And for the per uh, and the useful the utility of this, it's based on a theory of change perspective. So it starts with descriptive data about beneficiaries, budgets, and activities, but then then it asks for an evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses opportunities and threats and the most significant achievements of the program and key lessons key lessons learned and that analysis inform is informed by a theory of change perspective and asks what has changed as a result of the program the achievement of desired outcomes the people benefiting from the program and the degree of diversity of participants and it asks for self-reflection what are the lessons being learned and how sustainable are the changes achieved and that is all done around a theory of change perspective to inform that analysis. Right, that is my um, outline of the, the manual. Do. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you, Fred, as well. Um, yes, I'm John Taylor. I'm a lecturer in the Faculty of Health Sciences and Sport at the University of Stirling uh, in Scotland. And for the monitor, I've prepared some materials to help projects uh, process survey data um, to help assess the impact of the, the projects on the participants. And this has mainly be, been by way of preparing some uh, Excel spreadsheets. Um, so there are two. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully this will work well. There are two major sources of information um, that you can use um, to, to help you process the data. The first is the manual itself, and Fred has mentioned that the, the, the manual has a section on it uh, called uh, data analysis, which gives you a step by step guide on how to process the survey data. Um, and there is also a video which is available on the monitor website. So if you go onto the website, look under the, the heading uh, M&E. Um, can I just check that you are actually uh, seeing my the, the screen mark? Yes, we are. Yeah. We are, John. Good. So there's an m and &E video tab. If you click on that, um, it will take you um, to a video that I have recorded, uh, which is about 30 minutes long, which explains the process of how to process your data. And this mimics what is in the, the actual manual, the document itself. Um, so you can watch the video. I've also given you uh, a content of the video, so if there's specific uh, sections of the video that you want to, to look at, you can get straight to them by going to the specific time. And also on this page, um, the various Excel spreadsheets that have been designed are available for you. So you select the scales that you want. You can copy those from the manual, put them in your questionnaires, and then when it comes to the time to process the data, you can come onto the website, the monitor website, and select the relevant Excel spreadsheet for processing your data. Um, what I'm going to do um, today is give you an overview on processing that data so that you have a bit of an idea um, how this is actually done. But if you're uncertain about um, what to do, you can always go back to the manual and read about the process and get more information there, or you can go onto the video, have a look at the video or certain sections of the video, and it will explain what you're going to do. What we're going to do, what I'm going to show you just now is how to enter data into a spreadsheet. I'll show you the spreadsheet and how to enter the data. And we're going to do this with an imaginary questionnaire completed by a participant on the programme where there are a number of personal questions about the individual, what sex they are, what age they are, what's the highest level of education. 
and we're going to fill out data for uh, the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. So this has been, been included in the survey and people have responded um, to the, the items in the question. So I'm going to show you how you might enter those into um, the Excel spreadsheet. We've tried to make this as simple as possible, so hopefully you will be reasonably familiar with um, Excel. And if you notice on the Excel spreadsheet, there are a number of tabs along the bottom. When you open up initially, it should open on the data entry screen. This is the only screen at which you will be able to enter any information into. It's the only thing you need to add data to. The other screens, converted data, results, data output, graphs, and notes, you do not need to change. There's only that initial data entry screen that you need to add information into. So what I'm going to imagine is that we're using the questionnaire, this questionnaire that was returned, and I'll show you how to enter it, and I will show you what ends up in, um, in the actual uh, spreadsheet. So we want to give each person a participant number. So in the example here, this is P01. We know who this person is, but we don't want to put their name in to protect their identity, but we know who that person is. And then the person has responded uh, with a one because they're male. They've uh, written in 21 into the, um, the questionnaire because that's their age. They've ticked box number three, which means that their highest level of education was secondary school. And then on the questions on ethnicity or nationality and on disability, they've ticked one and ticked two. Now, there's no codes in here. Um, this is up to yourselves to decide what questions you would like to ask on ethnicity or nationality. So it might be that you know that item one, you would put in your questionnaire that maybe that is white. Item two is black, three Asian, four is mixed race, or five might be other. You get to choose what those are. And the same with disability. In this particular example, I've asked the question, do you have any long-standing illness, disability, or infirmness? And it's a simple answer, yes or no. But you might have, um, you might want to make that more sophisticated, give it more items, and you can choose to do that. So I can add that information into our spreadsheet. So I'll go on to the data entry, participant number one, and I'm going to type in P01. And I simply use the arrow buttons to move on to the, the next um, cell. The question was about the sex of a respondent. In this case, they typed one, so I'll add in one. They've not written anything in, so I'll not include that. Their age was 21. Their education was box number three. Their ethnicity was one and their disability was two. You will see there's a box there available for attendance, but you won't be able to put in their attendance until sometime um, after the, the program has actually begun. At this stage, we are entering information and in that's been collected at the very beginning of the process, so we can't fill out that particular box. Then we need to fill in information for the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, and there are 10 items on it in each column uh, represents each of the, the comments. So if we have a look at the questionnaire, for the 10 items, on the whole, I think I'm satisfied with myself. They tick agree, number three. At times, I think I'm no good at all. They ticked number one, strongly disagreed. So those are the responses. We can type those in to the Excel spreadsheet. So they went three, one, three, four, two, two, three, one, two, three. And you can see that that's quite quick to do. So even if you have quite a stack of questionnaires, it doesn't take long to put the information in. Now that we've added this information in, it will have, uh, the system will have updated the information on subsequent pages or um, sheets. So in the converted data, while I typed in one in the data entry screen, it shows in the, the converted sheet that this is a male respondent. 21 years of age, high school was the highest level of education, 
and they type one and two in for ethnicity and disability, but I don't have codes in for those just yet, but I know what they are. And then the numbers that I typed in for the Rosenberg self-esteem scale have been changed so that it allows a score to be calculated. And if we go onto the results tab, we can actually see for the, this respondent, P01, they have an individual self-esteem score of 23. Now the Rosenberg self-esteem score uh, runs from zero up to 30 um, and scores between 15 and 25 are considered as normal. So in this particular case, um, this individual has a self-esteem score of 23, which is considered normal. If we go to the data output, this is where you will get uh, your aggregated data from all this, the questionnaires. But because we've only got one entered in just now, we can see that there was one male, or oh, that's 100% of the whole sample. But the more we add in, the more this will change. And we can see information on the, the age. You get the youngest, the oldest, uh, um, the mean age of the individuals. So again, that information will be updated as you add the in. And then there are tables towards the right hand side which provide information on the Rosenberg self-esteem score. It gives us the mean Rosenberg self-esteem score before and after. But at present, we only have one respondent in, so it's not telling us any detailed information. Then it breaks it down in the next table by sex, by males, by females. So you can see that this information is updated as we go on. And then the graphs, it starts to put information into the graphs. This particular point, it's not that helpful. So what I'm going to do is show you a screen where we have entered information in for 17 respondents. So we've had 17 people complete the questionnaire and they've completed the Rosenberg self-esteem score. One thing that's important to note here is that when you're filling out the data, if anybody has missed any of the items, it's best not to include them in the data because you will not get complete results out at the end. So make sure that when people complete the survey scales that you give them to complete, get them to fill out every item. That way the data is much more usable. At this stage, it's only data for beforehand. You can add data in for after, so after a period, maybe three months or six months after a, a reasonable length of time, you can add further data in. But at this particular moment in time, um, it's just one set of data. We can look at the converted data that has been updated. We can look at the results and you can see the individual scores for each of your respondents. And you might be particularly interested in Respondent number 11, they have a very low self-esteem score. Maybe it's helpful for you to know that as part of diagnostic approach to helping the, the individuals in your program. If we look at the data output table, um, here we can see more data, 17 respondents, 47% of them were male, 47 female, and one person was identified as other or they didn't respond. We can see that in terms of age, the youngest one was 15, the oldest was 25 years of age, and there's a mean score of 18.2. And we can see for education wise, um, the highest, 31% of them, the highest level of education that they received was from high school, or well, 6% or one of them had actually gone to university. We can also see that there's further information um, about Rosenberg self-esteem score. So the average score for all respondents was 18.6. Uh, and if we look at by the sex of respondents, it's 19.5 for males or 17.8 for females. So males had a higher self, average self-esteem score than the females. And we can look at that information further down on tables by education, by their ethnic background, by their level of disability. Um, and also by, it will show you attendance once you put that information in. And we can also see the information in graphical form. So we can see that it's 18.6 is the mean score uh, for the respondents who completed the survey at the beginning of the project. You can actually copy these documents. You can just 
um, right click and um, hopefully you would be able to to save the items so you can copy them and paste them into a report and the same with the tables. After a certain period of time, um, you might want to repeat the survey. And again, you would go back to your data entry sheet and you would need to be able to match up the participants. So the person that was P01, whatever, whatever they complete for their second survey, the Rosenberg self-esteem score, you can enter the data in for them. So you have before and after scores. And if you add that in for all your respondents, making sure that all the, the scales are complete, you can look at the converted data and see that the information has also been updated for Rosenberg self-esteem score for the, the after survey. There's further information here um, on the results page so that you can see that the first respondent got a score of 23 at the beginning. That increased by 1 to 24, so only a very small change. But you can see how respondent scores changed. P06, for example, there was an increase in three points on the self-esteem score. If we go to the data output now, we have all the information that's entered in um, for both the before and after survey. So if we look at all the survey respondents, it was 18.6 mean Rosenberg self-esteem score at the beginning of the project and at the, the after survey, it was 19.5. So there was an increase in 0 0.08. Um, that's a rounded figure between the, the two survey points. And it also provides some information. There's a statistical test has been undertaken. The p-value was found to be 0 0.044, which is statistically significant. So there is a statistically significant change in the self-esteem scores for all respondents on this particular project. If we look at it by the males and the females, uh, the males increased their score from 19.5 up to 20.1, which was an increase of 0 0.06, but that is not statistically significant. But for the females, their self-esteem score increased from 17.8 to 19.0, which was a 1.3 uh, increase, and that was deemed to be statistically significant. So you could report that in your, your final report. And as I say, you can copy and paste that um, into a report and use some descriptive text around that. The tables below have also been updated with the after scores. Again, you can use this information in your reporting. And also the graphs have now been updated. So again, if you would rather uh, report your findings in graphical form, you can just copy these and bring them into your report. Also note there's some information in the notes tab, uh, which just explains a little bit about the score. In this case, the Rosenberg self-esteem score goes from zero to 30 with a normal range between 15 and 25. So that is a very brief summary um, of the, um, the process for um, taking the data from your questionnaires and putting it into the um, the different scales. One final thing, I might be running over time here. One final thing, um, there are obviously different scales, um, different spreadsheets for different scales. This one here is the resilience scale. And if I just show you in the data output section, for example, some of the scales give you more than one set of results. So for the resilience scale, there's a total resilience score. So that will be put in these tables here. But it also breaks that data down into two other subscales. So this one is personal resilience. So you'll get an extra set of scores there for personal resilience. And there are further tables which will show information on re relational resilience. So be aware that the scales sometimes produce more than one set of data. It's not just a total score. They might have subscales as well. So 
hopefully that gives you an overview of what's required. Some of you will be very familiar with processing data in no Excel and might be able to do that without much further explanation. But if you need any more information on what to do, go to the manual, section nine. It gives a step by step guide on how to do what I've just shown you. And it also has images there to show you what it looks like on screen or go to the video and you can listen to me again in the longer form, just explaining how that all works. Um, if that is not enough to help you, um, I am available. If you need to get in contact with me, uh, Mark and um, uh, Fred have asked if I'd be available to provide some guidance should it be needed. You can contact me. I'm sure you'll get contact details, but it's john.taylor at stir.ac.uk and I will try and help you out if you need it. There we go, Mark. Thank you very much, John. Um, as always, uh, uh, very cooperative and uh, very clear on the on the on the work that you've done. Uh, so again, yes, uh, thank you for that. And uh, we give the, the everybody the opportunity to make full use of, uh, of the tools that have been uh, constructed. So um, I don't know whether there are at this point uh, any specific questions uh, relating the, the, the presentation John has given? Um, if not, uh, I'm just looking around. I don't see any hands. So thank you, John. Um, thank you. I would like to give the floor to, uh, as I mentioned before, to one of uh, the partners, uh, one of the sport for employability organizations that have uh, been part of, uh, of our collaborative uh, partnership. Uh, to give some short uh, uh, feedback or, or comments on, on uh, and the response on uh, how they experienced uh, this this project, but more importantly also how they look at uh, the uh, the manual that we have produced. So uh, Saad Saad Mohammed, uh, as I mentioned before, is the head of uh, research and impact at Sport for Life UK. Um, Saad, I know you're there. Great. Uh, so I give the floor to you to uh, to just uh, give uh, give some uh, feedback from uh, from a practitioner's point of view. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, appreciate the um, the chance to get to speak. Um, and so, good morning and afternoon to everyone. So, um, just a bit about 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 our experience on the on the project, really, to begin with. Um, we've um, I, I think there there's a, so a couple of workshops. I think with um, so you know, with the with the folks that are leading the project, and um, and I think just from from that point of view itself, it was just a good way to sort of showcase what we do, but also to have um, some critical questions asked about um, about what we do um, in terms of our sort of monitoring and evaluation, data collection, why we do what we do, etc. So even from the in from the outset, it's been quite a useful experience for us. Um, I think what one of our values as an organization is that we're we're progressive so we're constantly sort of looking to do better in terms of uh, sort of especially in terms of our delivery but also in terms of our monitoring and evaluation and impact and and i think this this project specifically uh, i think helped us to just you know take that internal look in terms of what we do i think um fred um sort of quotes us and saying we don't know what we don't know and I think being sort of a small, medium-sized um, organisation, I think we sometimes are at the um, so we're looking at those with better expertise than ourselves to um, you know to sometimes sort of guide and support the the kind of work that we do, and that's really been helpful throughout this this project. Um, in terms of the manual itself, um, I think it really helped our um, our operations manager, but also our delivery team and um, and colleagues to actually. Um, again, just you know, do a bit of a sense check in terms of what we deliver. Do we, you know, what 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 are our outcomes and what we, um, you know, what what impact are we um, sort of looking to get? Um, as an organisation, we're very much focused around employability and um, a particular set of life skills um, that we measure. So, um, and, and I think something academic and, and a manual like this actually helps us to sort of broaden what we're actually um, what we're actually measuring, what we're actually looking at. And I think that that's been particularly useful just initially as a way of um, just reviewing some of our reviewing some of our outcomes and indicators and outputs that we that we have on our on our employability programs. Um, 
and, and and I think sort of following on from that, we had the opportunity to pilot a couple of the scales. So we we went with the brief resilience scale and the work locus of control, two scales that um, we picked because we thought, you know, sort of resilience isn't something that we probably directly measure within our life skills and work locus of control just because we wanted to, you know, see, you know, you know, you know what our young people think about sort of um, about their future prospects and whether they're sort of you know internally or externally um controlled and um, um and i think it was relatively straightforward so we have we have a team of five mentors that work on our employability program and we asked a couple you know each of them to um sort of carry out these skills with at least two young people on our um on our service and um and, and they they each found it so sort of quite a um quite a good experience just from the point of view that it was quite easy to do but also it sort of brought around some conversations with young people um, around things that we sort of previously maybe didn't talk about directly. Um, and what that's led us to do is just to, um, in, our, in our next company year, is really to review our impact on a more broader level. So looking at um, sort of looking at more than just our life skills and our employability skills, but sort of broadening, um, sort of looking, having a broader look at what our impact is. So things that we sort of directly or even indirectly um you know um it sort of indirectly um sort of impact so some of those intended and unintended consequences that we have um and i think especially things around um you know creating trusting relationships with mentors which is something that we maybe take for granted but actually sort of measuring that and also sort of things around sort of resilience and that work locus of control especially at a time where so we're coming out of a pandemic and we and young people that there, there is that sort of um, element of disillusionment amongst young people and especially across the UK and, and I'm sure this is the case for um, sort of wider across Europe and beyond that young people are disproportionately affected by um, by unemployment compared to the rest of the population and so specifically within that young people within those young people is also um, people from um, sort of diverse backgrounds so ethnic minorities. Uh, which make up uh, a large percentage of our population so actually having these tools at our disposal so you know may prove to be so sort of, you know quite good moving into the future um we haven't so sort of committed to sort of using any of the tools but it's but it's something that's now available for mentors should they feel they you know they need those tools to you know support our young people and sort of get that extra information and uh, and i think something fred mentioned um a bit earlier around using it for induction purposes again is so sort of, is quite a poignant um sort of point again it's not something that we we'd considered but it's it, you know it's a bit of a light bulb moment in terms of really simplifying um academic language so that um so that sort of mentors or, or, or sort of uh, trainers can actually understand that but also then relay that to young people in terms of you know you know what you know what we're looking to achieve so again, that's something I think we can we'll, we'll probably sort of consider going forward is actually using some of that for um, induction purposes too. Um, I think then overall it's been sort of a really positive experience. I know that our operations manager has really sort of benefited from um, sort of how this has helped to um, how how this has helped in terms of our program design and delivery. But it's also given us that we've been able to look inwardly in terms of what we deliver and actually um, you, you know, what what actual impact that we're having. Um, but also sort of moving forwards is, you know, how can we broaden that and how can we do better for our young people? And that's ultimately what, what we're about and, 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 and all the organisations that have taken part in the project. It's really all about what's, what's the best thing that we can do for our young people in, in order to have, you know, uh, the biggest and most meaningful impact. And as an aside as well, I guess it's, it's not the main thing, but also, we, you know, you, we need to be able to, and it's the way of the world that you need to be able to, um, evidence the impact that you have with the young people and, and something like this um, does support that especially at a time where moving young people into employability em employment is slightly more tougher now because of the sort of uh, sort of because of the pandemic but actually being able to showcase that you know that you know these are elements of employability that we have improved so you could look at um, resilience self-esteem you can, you can also look at things like job readiness um, but you know so so where where funders and um are sort of you know looking for reports into into you know what what work you've been doing again you can have that broader look that's more than just um life skills and employability in our case um to actually showcase the impact that our sort of programs are having with with young people um yes that that's about that's about it from me <laughs> thank you 
Thank you very much, uh, Saad. It was very inspiring and uh, also very uh, interesting to see uh, to what extent that uh, relates to what you are doing, uh, what we have uh, produced and, and how you can uh, use it uh, in your uh, future activities. And that is, by the way, something we noted when we talked to our uh, all our partners, uh, when we visited them on uh, several occasions and were in, in, in contact with them. So uh, we just wanted to use uh, an example uh, from uh, Sport for Life to see the practitioner side and, and the, uh, the relevance. And I, I hope we can uh, be as relevant for as many organizations uh, to follow. Um, I would uh, I would now give also the opportunity uh, to uh, to have uh, to have Q and A. So I would uh, I would definitely invite you to. Uh, to uh, ask any type of questions that you uh, might have um, um, that uh, that you think uh, will be uh, will be important to ask right now, but as uh, as John already mentioned, and that uh, that counts also also for us of course as a coordinating partner, that we can uh, be available for any type of uh, questions that you might have after the webinar. Um, so the, the floor is is all yours so you can use the chat as well and i know some people have already used the chat and we have tried to respond as 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 as, as good as possible for this um so feel please feel free if you have any questions uh, that are coming up so once again thank you uh, i'm not seeing any more questions coming in uh, i see a lot of uh, positive responses uh, thank you for this uh, i would as i mentioned uh, uh, use the opportunity to make some uh, some closing comments here, um, which uh, basically, uh, when we look back, uh, we had a very positive experience in working with our partners. Uh, we still are because the, the 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 project is not officially ended. But I want to express, uh, uh, on behalf of our uh, coordinating team, our sincere uh, appreciation for the way we were uh, uh, well received. Uh, uh, and uh, we were came across their their valuable work that they're doing, and also in response to their very uh, inspiring uh, comments they made to our uh, to our work we did. So, thank you. Uh, this uh, really shows uh, that we were on the right track uh, within this collaborative partnership. Uh, they all agreed that uh, M&E is an essential aspect uh, for optimizing the efficiency and the effectiveness of, of their work. And also in a in a more uh, broader sense to uh, sport for development organizations. And also, as being mentioned by uh, by some of the speakers before me, uh, legitimizing uh, their work to the outside. So I think um, we really think we we made a good decision in in focusing on on, on providing an M&E, uh, um, and that's what we did basically by by looking at uh, the project. We tried to take the evaluation beyond mere anecdotal uh, narrative. And, and output measurement, and because this is often the case uh, that uh, organizations are confronted with, uh, knowing uh, how how to make any more further steps than just coming up with numbers of uh, participants uh, or using uh, uh, anecdotal ev evidence and narratives there. So we hope we have uh, provided some uh, some contribution on that part. Uh, we see it, of course, as a tool, you know, a tool to inspire organizations to make use of a more systematic approach. Of M and E, including a theory of change, it is there for you to to use and and take what is useful and develop from there. We would say uh, it's like Fred already mentioned; it's not a one size fits all, uh, but it's at least something which uh, can then can be inspirational for organizations already working in that field, like what uh, Saad explained, but also those that might uh, think of moving in that direction and and looking for employability. Uh, development as well um, so and and i would like to stress uh, the importance of our website to visit our website because as of today and you might want to have a look at our website uh, um, which uh, which now has the manual available on the pdf you can download it for free the excel spreadsheets are there as well so you can download them and you can also uh, see the video as uh, John had already explained. So everything as of today, and it's really only today that it's uh, available now, you can find all this information. And we will also make available the presentations um, later on this week. We will make uh, these available as well 
on the, on the website. So um, looking at uh, the final thing I would like to stress and, and, and ask your attention is the uh, the uh, online conference, the final conference we have uh, about sport for employability, uh, which is scheduled for June uh, 17, uh, from 9.30 to, uh, till noon, uh, Central European time. Uh, also on our website, you can now register. It's uh, open, registration is open. Again, it's for free, but we like you to register uh, that you can uh, that you can uh, attend the, the conference. Um, uh, what is the content about this uh, this conference, and and where what is it aimed for? So it's it's to reflect among different uh, stakeholders, be it in sport, being out of of sport, on the potential sport for employability initiative, targeting young needs, and to address a number of uh, policy and uh, re relevant issues related to conditions for effective and efficient uh, functioning of these types of initiatives. So it goes a step further than what we've uh, uh, looked at today. Today was focused on the manual. We would use uh, the final conference to make it a broader uh, perspective on sport for employability, because I can imagine that a lot of people still uh, are not very uh, clear on what that actually means. So we will make use of uh, of several. Uh, uh, we will make use of this conference to do that. So general intro to the topic, including the role of sport, including the, the role of uh, program theory, for that matter. Uh, we will uh, explain a little bit more about the program theory that we have uh, developed, uh, 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 as uh, as mentioned by uh, by myself and Fred uh, uh, during the presentations. We will use some inspiring examples of practitioners showing uh, sharing their. Uh, their uh, their work and how they uh, actually do it in uh, in uh, <clears throat> in using sport as a tool for uh, developing employability skills. Uh, we will have a short uh, but very very brief uh, uh, intro to the manual, but not of course not as extensive as we did today because uh, that's not uh, the intention of the program. And and we will uh, look at ways forward, and we hope to have an interesting policy debate, looking at. Um, what type of uh, steps and recommendations can be made for for uh, for all types of you might say levels uh, policy related levels uh, be it locally be it uh, eu uh, on the eu level but also as well as uh, the comment has been made on an international level so we really look uh, forward to uh, to uh, to go ahead and and uh, knowing from the attendance of uh, this uh, webinar where we have seen people coming in from uh, both the EU as well as outside of the EU. We see people coming in from Asia as well. Uh, so that's uh, really well appreciated. So I would encourage you to also uh, come in and register for the final uh, conference uh, in three weeks time. Um, so we come to the end and uh, unless uh, we uh, see any more questions and I think I don't see any more questions. I, uh, on behalf of the uh, coordinating team, I would thank you for attending uh, this webinar. Wish you a pleasant day uh, for the rest and hope to see you, of course, on uh, June uh, 17th.